Maybe you want to learn about movies, broaden your horizons, discover a new taste, or kick ass at bar trivia. Either way, there's a whole new world of films out there, and these are our picks of the 10 most important film movements of all time. Kicking us off at number 10, we want to start off by tipping our hats and puffing our pipes at the filmmakers of the British Commonwealth. But it's not for one of cinema's earliest movements from the Brighton School or their dirty prison colony down under's New Wave, which you can thank for Mad Max. Instead, it's for their 1950s and 60s British New Wave. Rub your right, left, and center. After they've skinned you dry, you get called up in the army and get shot to death. Now sure, British New Wave might be one of the lesser New Waves in a list filled with an infuriating amount of New Waves. Seriously, every film movement and its mother is called a New Wave. But it gave us a healthy dose of disillusionment, free cinema, angry young men, and kitchen sink realism. Now those might just sound like words, but they were actually pretty important innovations in a less conventional British cinema. One that focused more on the realities of working class daily life than the flights of unbelievable fancy that came before. And if you're thinking to yourself, hey, I should check that out, then we recommend Saturday night and Sunday morning, and if to start. Next up at number 9, we're turning our eyes towards the Scandinavian province. And as for movements, there's been Swedish silent cinema where golden age greats like Ustrom and Stiller left their impact before leaving for Hollywood. The Phantom Carriage is a good starting point. And you also may have heard of Dogma 95, Thomas Vinterberg and Lars von Trier's avant-garde movement that disavowed titles, lights, dollies, tricks, and dishonesty. Check out The Celebration and The Idiots to get started there. However, our number 9 pick actually goes to the Scandinavian revival that took place in the 40s and 50s. Jag är döden. Kommer du för att hämta mig? Jag har redan länge gått till din sida. In Nazi-occupied Denmark, allied import bans led to an uptick in domestic filmmaking. And while the rest of the world was churning out propaganda during World War II, neutral Sweden banned it and made their own films instead. So when the post-war economy recovered, Scandinavian film returned in full force. Dark, monochrome, slow, and a little bit mystical, with old directors reborn like Carl Theodore Dreyer and newer talents emerging like Ingmar Bergman making films like Day of Wrath and The Seventh Seal. For number 8, we've had enough of white people for now, and turn our attention to the East for Asian cinema movements. But of course, Asia is really freaking big and this list is pretty damn small, so unfortunately we're going to have to be a little bit reductive. And honestly, it has a whole lot more to do with gaps in our knowledge than a lack of quality Asian cinema. There was China's fifth generation, notable for our frequent favorite Yi Mu Shang, India's parallel cinema with Satyajit Ray, Hong Kong New Wave, South Korea New Wave, Taiwan New Wave, and Iranian New Wave, basically a whole metric sh ton of new waves. Even Japan had a new wave, but for our number 8 pick, we're actually giving it to Japan's golden age of cinema. Basically, a little while after World War II, America finally left Japan unoccupied and uncensored, and so a bunch of super bored of propaganda Japanese directors unleashed all their creativity all at once, won a bunch of film festivals, and became a big deal. The big three, Akira Kurosawa, Kenji Mizuguchi, and Yasujiro Ozu, all made their films wildly different. Kurosawa cut his like a western, Ozu cut his like a maverick, and Mizuguchi hardly cut at all, but they somehow fit together, which is what makes them great. If you're a newbie to Japanese film, start with Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. If you're looking for something a little slower, more artsy and different, go with Ozu's Tokyo Story. First, a little recognition. There's always been some healthy geographic cross-pollination in film movements. Movements ripple in both cause and effect well beyond security checkpoints. For most of this list, we're looking at film movement lines drawn along country borders, and often this is appropriate. The avant-garde tends to have regional thrust, but occasionally it doesn't, and we're boxed into a cultural short-sightedness when film scholarship is more provincial than film authorship. The direct cinema, cinema verite documentary movement radically changed the face of non-fiction filmmaking worldwide, and surrealist cinema moved across the entire face of Europe. But for our number 7 pick, we're giving it to the new queer cinema, a film movement that embraced gender and sexuality as socially constructed objects, uniting queer-friendly independent filmmakers across the world. The movement pushed acceptance of LGBTQ themes up from the depths of art house into the mainstream, from Paris's Burning, Mala Noche, and Go Fish, all the way up to Brokeback Mountain and Milk. Next up at number six, we think it's important that everybody learn a little bit about third cinema. 
Now, if first cinema is for commercial gain and second cinema is for the sake of art, third cinema was conceived of as a form of revolution. Staunchly anti-colonial in countries of the third world, third cinema was conceived of in Latin America in the 50s and 60s to raise political awareness amongst the oppressed amidst a heavily censored landscape. Now, this means that state funding and multiplex exhibition were out of the question, so third cinema was guerrilla through and through. They raised money from unusual sources, shot their films swapping roles like free-loving hippie collectives, and showed their finished work at renegade folding chair screenings in the ruralist of areas. Latin America has had a number of noteworthy movements that have tended towards revolutionary. Brazil's Cinema Novo, Argentina's Grupo Cine Liberación, and Cuban Revolutionary Cinema. But their most political of aspirations found shelter under the umbrella of third cinema. And it didn't stop there. Third cinema's rebel yell has echoed across all continents where colonialism was a problem, from South America to Africa to Asia and even back to Europe. Check out The Hour of the Furnaces for the documentary that set it all off, and Zala for a Senegalese narrative that shows how far-reaching this movement really was. Flying back to Europe for our number five, we're taking a look at Italy. And film movement-wise, that maybe could have been Italian futurism if most of the films hadn't been lost. Or it might have been the Italian New Wave that debuted Pasolini and Bertolucci. However, it's hard to find a more important Italian movement than its famous post-war neorealism. <laughs> Umberto Domenico Ferrari. After World War II, are you seeing a trend here? With their official film studios all but destroyed, neorealist filmmakers moved to the streets. Polished studio dramas gave way to on-location stories filled with lower-class non-actors struggling to go about their normal lives in the shadow of the war. Its bleak honesty shook audiences up and injected a dose of grit into a film world filled with wish fulfillment and leftover propaganda braggadocio. Almost everybody recommends De Sica's Bicycle Thieves to start, and they're right, there's hardly a better introduction. Next up at number four, we're turning our eye to Germany. And while we're sure everyone would be thrilled if we decided to honor the Nazi-era propaganda films, we're gonna skip it. Instead, we could look to new German cinema, an avant-garde movement that most notably gave us filmmakers like Werner Herzog, Wim Wenders, and Rainer Werner Fassbender. However, we want to look back a bit further to Germany's first moment in the cinema spotlight with German expressionism. You might know the movement for its really shadowy movies with a set designer who either had a severe case of vertigo or was very, very drunk. Of course, the set designer didn't have vertigo and he only might have been drunk because expressionism was all about saying fuck you to reality and finding a new mode of expression to grapple with art and honesty in the midst of modernity and the aftermath of World War One and all its horrors. The goal was to make the inner outer, to render the invisible visible by throwing it on screen, all exaggerated in shape and color and emotion and forcing us to look at it laid bare. And if that sounds interesting to you, you might want to check out Vine's Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Murnau's Nosferatu for a crash course in expressionism. Next up at number three, we're turning our eyes towards Eastern Europe. So we've got Romanian New Wave, the Czech New Wave, and the Polish School. Of course, the socialist realism that they were rebelling against was a worthy movement in its own right, if heavily mired in propaganda. However, for our number three pick, we're giving it to the Soviet montage movement headed by Kuleshov, Eisenstein, Pudovkin, and Vertov. Sure, they all had different approaches to it, but the Soviet montage school of thought identified cutting as the one thing that made films special and unique from every other art form, and took that idea and ran with it creating entire doctrines of filmmaking around the brilliance of the cut. And while they may have been a little hyper-focused on it, their innovations in editing inform almost every cut today, whether we know it or not. So give it a try. Check out Eisenstein's Strike and Vertov's Man with the Movie Camera for your Soviet montage primer. Moving in at number two, we can't forget about the movements of America. Sure, Hollywood's pretty obvious, but we can't ignore its massive influences. There's been no wave film starring Jim Jarmusch, Mumblecore starring Joe Swanberg and the Duplass brothers, and the L.A. Rebellion School starring Charles Burnett and Haile Garima. There was the age of the movie brats, well-educated filmmakers like Spielberg and Coppola who sublimated their eclectic global tastes into the classic Hollywood style. And there's also been post-classical Hollywood, which saw an incredible infiltration of European new wave styles into the American mainstream in breach of classic Hollywood style. But if you're noticing the common theme, most of these styles are created in opposition to something, and that something is the classical Hollywood continuity style that formed during our number two pick, the golden age of Hollywood. Well, Rick, you're not only a sentimentalist, but you've become a patriot. I believe it seemed like a good time to start. 
I think perhaps you're right. Thanks to a continually war-ravaged Europe, the American film industry remained relatively unscathed and a popular destination for refugee filmmakers. As a result, Hollywood was uniquely positioned to dominate the market and create one of the most enduring modes of filmmaking ever, invisible filmmaking. You're probably already very familiar with Golden Age films, but if you need a starter kit, you can't go wrong with Casablanca, Stagecoach, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And finally, closing us out at number one, how could we forget the French? Now, France has had a whole lot of official film movements, and sure, that's probably because they've had a very active film industry with close ties between academia, criticism, the art house, and the mainstream. But we like to think it also has something to do with the fact that they just enjoy grouping things together and naming movements. And as for movements, oof, they've had French Impressionism, Poetic Realism, French New Look, and the new French Extremity. I mean, they're definitely really good at coming up with movement names. But for our number one, one pick, could it be anything other than the Nouvelle Vague? Arthur regarde sans arrêt ses pieds, mais il pense à la bouche de Lille, à ses baisers romantiques. In a world where movies were made by teams at big studios using the same stars and the same formulas, and emphasis was put on commercializing a product instead of exploring an art, the new wave was a dramatic reaction. Truffaut, Godard, Chabrol, Romer, and Rivette, basically a bunch of film lovers with a magazine, burst onto the scene with some dramatic ideas. Film should express the truth, not pander to viewers. Film should be made by an auteur, not a committee. It should be complex instead of spoon-fed. A movie should be a kick in the pants, not a lazy escape. They broke rules they asked us the big questions and showed us the mundane. They jumped their cuts, tracked their shots, improvised their dialogue, addressed the camera directly, and ruined the illusion. Start with Godard's Breathless and Truffaut's 400 Blows, and then just get lost in it, because the movement was massive, international, and has had a bigger impact than you can ever imagine, which is why we think it's the most important film movement of all time. So what do you think? We know we just skimmed the surface, but do you want another list that goes over some of the hidden gems we honorably mentioned here? Hit like and leave a comment to let us know, and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists.